Have you ever watched a great athlete as they prepare for some crucial moment in a game? Perhaps a penalty kick or an important service in a match. And there is about them, about the greats amongst them, a calmness, a quietness, a a focusedness, a stillness under great pressure, which is deeply impressive. By contrast, I suspect that we are part of the most distracted culture in the history of human beings. We, are, um, we have the shortest attention spans. There is this constant stream of information and entertainment clamoring for our attention. And it leaves us always feeling stressed and overwhelmed and ironically bored. As the poet Rilke says, we lead our lives so poorly because we are always unprepared, incapable, and too distracted for anything. Isn't that interesting? So we're looking at this wonderful letter of one Peter. And um, Peter is at the end of his life, and he is in Rome And we know that he's in Rome because of a really interesting phrase that he uses at the end of this epistle. He talks about she who is in Babylon sending her greetings. And Babylon, it seems, is a sort of early church code for Rome. It was a dangerous place to be a Christian, and so being rude about Rome was probably not always a great idea. And so Babylon was this sort of code word that they used. And of course, Babylon was a metaphor for a place of worldliness and godlessness and debauchery and sort of terrible distractions. And so from the heart of the empire, Peter is writing to Christians around the world and he's encouraging them and inspiring them. And what does he want to inspire them to do? It's this. He wants them to live intentionally. To live like they mean it. To be purposeful and hopeful. To live joyful and holy lives for God. Instead of a world constantly distracted and running after all sorts of things, Peter wants to call those first Christians, as he wants to call us, to set our focus on that which is most important and to seek it before all things. He says this in verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set your hope on the grace that you find in Jesus Christ. Do you see that picture of preparing your mind for action? It's the very opposite of the distractedness that is so easy to us. Preparing your mind for action means to still the noise, to pay attention to that which is in front of you, to be still and know that God is God. It's not to be busy, but it's to be prepared and focused and calmed and alert and aware. You might notice that we kind of do that at the beginning of every service because we come in with all of our worries and our busyness and all of our racing thoughts and we want to still ourselves, to still our hearts and our minds, to, um, to prepare ourselves, to hear from God, to know his presence. And in that stillness, there is a wonderful thing, a remarkable thing, because there is something of the knowledge of God that knowledge that we are loved, that our lives matter, that God has a purpose for us. That as we prepare ourselves, as we pay attention, we find the peace of God. I find it a really restful place when life is demanding, when I'm being pulled in all sorts of directions. What I need to do is to still myself in God's presence. And there, 
find rest and restoration. It is not easy. In fact, it's really quite demanding sometimes to do that. But it requires practice. And just like the great athlete who had to learn that little by little, so we can learn that little by little. It might just be five minutes at the start of the day, but what a way to start the day that is. To still yourself, to seek the presence of God, to prepare your mind for action, and to discipline yourself. Here's a question for you. What is the most complicated object in the entire known universe? Cas. The knee. The knee? Yeah. No. <laughs> Anyone try again? <laughs> it's not the knee. <laughs> it's the human brain. But isn't that an astonishing thing? The human brain has in it 100 trillion synoptic connections. It is an utterly astonishing thing in your head. And you might think, what, what, even my brain? Yeah. It is, that is the most complicated and sophisticated thing in the entire universe. You are carrying around in your head something more complicated and sophisticated than the greatest supercomputer. Learning to use that well is, it might be one of the most important things that you do. I don't know about you, but mine feels like it's kind of slightly out of control a lot of the time. Or is that just me? It's like, um, like being behind the wheel of, um, of a really good sports car, but not being able to drive very well. And there's always a danger that you're going to crash into something. I think this discipline of learning to manage these incredible brains that we have, to still them, to be in control of them, is such a valuable and important thing. And what Peter is calling us to do is to use our minds well, to set our focus on the most important thing. Instead of shooting off in all sorts of directions, being distracted all the time, to set our focus, verse 13, to set your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ brings. I'm really struck that we allow ourselves to be distracted a lot of the time. It's as if we quite like it. It's as if the job of actually paying attention, of focusing on reality as it is, is a bit too hard for us, and we quite like to be distracted. Have you ever noticed that tendency? Again, this might just be me. In a difficult conversation, my temptation is always to go to my phone. As if what's in front of me is a bit too hard, and that's just easier. I'd rather just distract myself. Or if I'm tired, if I get home on a Sunday night and I'm feeling a bit worn out, oh, I'll, just, I'll just get on YouTube a little bit and distract myself. And it's a form of relaxing, but I don't think it's actually very restful at all. It's a distraction. And, um, oh, I don't know, here's the thing. That distraction is your attention being up for sale. So what I mean by that is that they always say with um, like social media and things, if you're not paying for it, if you're not the customer, you are the product. Your attention is being sold by these incredible companies, whatever they are, Facebook or, or Google or something, uh, but it's been sold for profit. And so they will sort of feed you half a dozen things that kind of grab your attention, and then they will throw an advert at you, and someone's paying for that advert. They're paying for your attention. It's a really interesting thought, isn't it? If we take seriously that our attention, what we focus on matters, then instead of allowing it to be sold off to somebody who will probably you know, try and tap into uh, not our greatest desires, but actually choose to use our attention for, for what matters most, Well, I think that would be a really good thing. Learn to set your focus 
says Peter, on the grace and the goodness and the love of God. A grace which is all around you, if only you can see through the noise. If you can set your heart on God and you discover that that's where real life and real riches lie. Our wealth is not found in stuff. It's in the beauty of creation. It's in the wonder of relationships and love and the presence of God. If you are children of God, you are heirs of all creation. You don't need someone to sell you some cheap rubbish to satisfy you. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That is yours to be delighted in. So Peter says, set your focus. Take control. Be disciplined. Pay attention to that which matters. And don't be distracted all the time. Secondly, he says, pay attention to the word of God. And again, this is really rather delightful. I don't know if you saw in that opening paragraph of our reading that he was talking about the Old Testament. He was talking about the fact that uh, those who were writing it didn't realize that they were doing it for your benefit and that they were sort of revealing Christ in all these different ways. And then at the end of it, he said, even angels long to look into these things. Now, I don't know how you're doing with the Bible. It can feel like a difficult discipline to actually spend time reading God's word. But it is more than simply the word of God. It is more than simply the wisdom of God. It is a means by which our lives and our minds and our hearts are shaped. Our character is formed by God's word. And it reveals to us these kind of wonderful things. The truth about Jesus, the wonders of the universe, so much so that angels long to look into it. Isn't that a delightful thing? So next time you're struggling to discipline yourself to actually spend a bit of time reading the Bible, remember that angels would quite like to be doing that. And they seem not to have the option. Amazing. So pay attention to God's word. Allow it to shape who you are. One of the things that I have found most valuable, and particularly in some of the hardest times of life, are the Psalms. That there is in the Psalms um, a richness of wisdom and of human experience, or of human experience kind of in response to God, which has able, been able to speak to my soul at some of the hardest times of my life. And I could not have imagined going through some of those things without that. And the only way to have that is to just read a little bit every day and hear that wisdom of God speak into our lives. So pay attention to the word of God. And verse 14, this is a really interesting phrase. Peter says, become like obedient children. Now that's a really interesting phrase and I'm not naturally an obedient, I was not naturally an obedient child. I grew up in Liverpool. We do our own thing in Liverpool. Um, obedience was not one of those things. And so I've had to learn through my life that actually obedience is not a negative thing. That being an obedient child only works in relationship with a wonderful, loving parent or heavenly father in this case. And that as you discover that if what you're in relationship with is somebody who wants the absolute best for you, then obedience makes sense. And um, a child in a right relationship with a loving parent is a place of incredible privilege, of being loved, of being safe, of belonging, of finding a status, a value, and an inheritance in that place. Now, the truth is, of course, by nature, we all fall short. We have these rebellious hearts. We go our own way. And that's why in every service we say confession. Because we recognize that all of us have fallen short. All of us have gone our own way. But we are learning that despite what we tend to think, God knows best. There's a revelation for you, isn't it? God knows better than you do. And his purposes for you are good Peter says, become like obedient children for what God has for you is the best. And all of that, all of that is what Peter calls holiness. 
Verse 15. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy for I am holy. As we spend time in the presence of a holy God, we become like him. Holiness is more than simply being good. Holiness is living as we were intended to live. Holiness looks like Jesus, who is in that perfect relationship with God, who lives as God would have him live, and who shows us life in all its fullness, fully alive to God, fully alive to others. Do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance, says Peter. Don't be conformed to this world with all of its noise and all its distractions, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus is our model, a life wholeheartedly lived, trusting in God, invested in his kingdom, rich in love and beauty, delighting in God, learning that Incredible stillness, peace, even under the greatest pressure. You have each been entrusted with the most sophisticated and complex object in the entire universe. Learn to use it well. We never stop learning. Put it to good use. Set your focus on those things which matter most, which are most wonderful. Learn to use it well. Verse 13, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourself. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ brings when he is revealed. Amen.